what we're doing, investing in this land and bringing people from all over the state, bringing, you know, different things from all over the state, is to be able to take this land and transform it into a place that is a safe place. A place that is for people who, who need the extra hand, whether it is through a handicap facility or job offering for those who have lost limbs in the earthquake or are deaf or for those who are limited by drug abuse and stuff like that. So this is where the safe haven is going to be. You are standing on the first acre of land where literally the place that we are carving out of the mountain is going to be our church. And so our church is going to butt up right against the street so that anyone and anyone can walk in. Um, and then right here, it's going to be right next to it, it's going to be our school. And the neat thing is that education is huge. It's huge. Um, everyone wants education. And so it's not offered to handicapped children. It's not offered for those who have limitations. And so um, the neat thing is that we're going to have the school. It's going to be offered to the community, but also have a place where the kids that have special needs that either are physically rejected or mentally rejected can go to school, can go to their facility and come and, you know, be proud and have the backpacks and have the school and have the education that's on their level and show the world that they are worth their time and education because that's a huge part. And so now we have the church and school and then this flat piece of property is going to be kind of our community outreach center where we're going to have a basketball court, court we're going to have a soccer thing, we're going to have a playground where it's kind of your outdoor YMCA for the community kids. All these kids here don't really have a place to hang out. They don't have a safe haven. They don't, a lot of these kids, I tell people, I'm like, they hang out and play by the temple. Um, on Safalor, which is our, what we call our voodoo temple, is right next door to this place. It takes less than 10 minutes to get to it. And people don't realize that this is their neighborhood. Um, when, my neighbor, when my workers were informed where we were going, the first thing they said to me in an hour and a half discussion was, you're taking our kids to voodoo, like you're taking our kids to darkness. And our, my response was, darkness doesn't exist when there's light there. I said, so it's not going to exist anymore. I said, so the neat thing is, is we're going in and invading that space. And so that's kind of what this center is going to be. We'll walk down there and peer at that property over there. And I'll show you guys kind of what my heart and passion and dance is and what it's going to look like. And kind of why you guys are here. Northwest Haiti Christian Mission. So yeah. We are, we are Haitian ran. So there's not a lot of rules on that versus other countries where it's like you have to go through. Um, so this is actually one of my favorite parts of the tour because you are standing at the entry gate of the new facility for the handicapped children. And um, the way that I explained it to a couple of you who were just lucky enough to hear me talk over and over again is that the Miriam Center back at the mission is a place that we took kids that were invisible, that weren't seen because of cultural or behavior or mentally, and we, we took them into being children. We taught them what it meant to laugh, and we taught them what it meant to laugh hard over Play-Doh and shaving cream and, and slip and slides, which was awesome. And we, we taught them how to be kids and which they've never had the experience. And then we taught, and then this facility is set up to teach them from being kids to being adults. Mm. That's why we're doing it, because we realize that we have an incredibly unique combination that makes up Northwest Haiti Christian Mission, especially the Miriam Center. We have a, an amazing survival rate of handicapped children. I have 30 kids that are thriving. And we have a no adoption policy, which I stand by just for what we do because we have this, this thing that we're going to raise at the next set of Haitians to change Haiti. And for a while it was like, well, handicapped kids would thrive so much better in the States. Yeah, but those handicapped children are, are changing Haiti from the inside out. They're telling the world around them that they're new. Someone asked me, what do I see in 20 years? I tell them, I see the next generation of dis disabled handicapped kids not having a disability, but having an amazing, unique way of how to love others and what it means to fight, mm -hmm. what it means to look at someone and not, and not see limitations. And so this is kind of what we're doing. So you're standing at the doorway where um, in the middle of this acre is going to be a gigantic, multicolored, multi-story, as brightly as I can get it, playground. Handicapped playground. Picture the brightest one you can and stick it there. I like color. <laughs> I, they, we have an inside joke that if they're going to make you put tin roofs on something, um, about a Mm, five minutes that way there is a house that has a tin roof that is just like somehow it's like I think it's plastic coating and it's just brightly colored rainbow and I looked at that and said if I'm doing tin roof I want that one and so this is just think of the most brightly colored playground you can find and then we're going to have housing units 
that the neat thing with this is that looking at how to figure out how to bring children from being adults, you have to look at them as being unique. We have this policy of, we have this philosophy that every child it gets to have potential, no matter what it is. Whether it is the ability to wiggle their toes or the ability to be loved on and have someone change their diapers every two hours and hold them and, you know, and if it, what it means to go to school and what it means to be independent and grow up. And so the neat thing is, is that I looked at the 50 kids that we have that are going to be our foundation here and looked at them and categorized them into the best housing units that they need. And so the first thing that happened was they're all gender separated. There's a couple that aren't, but it's based off the fact that they're either babies and will be soon placed in gender appropriate houses or that they are at a point where they can be in the same thing and they don't really know. And so the neat thing is, is that we're going to have a housing unit that is specifically for independent boys. Mm -hmm. And that's all your, well, like your Den Den, your Steven, and your John, the ones that are, are fully independent, potty trained, you know, are going to learn what it means to share a room and have responsibility and make their food and do their laundry and be independent and have chores and, you know, what it means to go to school. And it, they're going to learn how to be adults because the thing is, is it doesn't exist here. We're, we're changing Haiti from the inside out because we're putting potential on children and telling them that, you know what, instead of keep trying to keep you from surviving day to day, we're going to try to, we're going to place on you what it means to survive 20 years down the line. And so we're going to do that, and then we do that combination between health and food, and, you know, and so we're going to have U-shaped housing units. They're going to be U-shaped, and your entrance is going to be the middle of the U, and the legs of the U are going to be the um, bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be able to do that. And if any of you have been in the Miriam Center, there, that long hallway that goes into the two back bedrooms just that, that has the screens, we're going to do it where we're going to stick windows all the way around the entire thing, which doesn't seem much, but to me it, it takes away electricity and, you know, helps us survive in an incredibly, incredibly hot climate. And so we're going to have these, we're going to have about eight of them on the first story that are going to feed up and around and um, into that playground. So the kids get to wake up and the first thing they get to do is, you know, playground. I have this, I have many philosophies, but one of them is if they're going to get stitches in their lifetime, they're going to earn it. Mm -hmm. So place the gigantic playground in the middle, get the kids bunk beds, let them be boys, you know. I have children, I have a little one who eats it all the time because his thing is he loves to climb things, and so I made him a bunk bed. And that's kind of solved the problem, actually. Um, and so it's letting them be kids, and then once they're done being kids, letting them be adults, and letting them be safe, and letting, because I'll, I'll, I'll tell people, my children know, a lot of my kids know that they are eight-year-old kids and they have limitations. And so what does it look like when they're 28? You know, you, you can't consistently give them what they needed when they were eight, and so it's, you have to evolve around them. And the neat thing is we have the freedom to do that here, and that's kind of what you guys are fighting for, is you guys are fighting for the next generation of kids and the next generation of things. And so it's going to all spill out into the playground, and then right here we're going to have a director's house so that I can be, you know, top dog at all times. And then around the back, we're going to have a dining hall, which is incredibly important for me because what it does is it's going to have fellowship on a, a universal level. So instead of eating in your individual houses or your individual programs, for three meals a day, you all come together. And so we're going to have the short-termers and the American staff and the Haitian staff and the, ha and the handicapped children and the grandmen, which is our old folks, all come together and join one meal. And so you eat together. So when you're done eating and your friend is, has his face down into a plate because that's how he eats, you can turn around and help him. And, you know, and so it's going to be a fellowship thing. And so that's going to be on the first story. The next door we're gonna, next to it, we're going to have a physical therapy room. And that's just going to be where I put all fancy little equipment that helps these kids walk. And then when I don't have fancy people that will run these fancy equipment, but in here we're going to have gigantic gigantic foam playgrounds so they can roll and thump and run into things. And, you know, and then... Next year we're going to have an education system where I can play with my big knob puzzles and my shaving cream and my sensory tables. And so it's kind of neat because there's always the amazing ability to always minister to these kids and play with them. And I, tell, I was telling someone on the way in, look at it as your 24-hour really fancy summer camp where that's how it's going to be, where these kids will always have something to do. Um, the neat thing is we are starting the next generation of facilities where it's just not 24-hour care. It's so much more. It looks into what it means to give them an outreach program and, and a school and you know it's just not trying to keep them alive from day to day but keep them thriving from year to year. And so on the same level we're going to have a construction room because I like my power tools. I like when people can actually come and use my power tools and be able to create things and stuff. And then on the second story we're going to have two more family units for the deaf kids. 
Um, we're going to do a boarding school for them because right now I tell them that they go to school from 8 to 11 and they live in an incredibly silent world. Where they, when they're not with us and communicating with us, no one talks to them. They live in an incredibly bleak and incredibly silent world and so we are able to open those doors and stuff like that. And then the second story is where you guys kind of come in where we'll have the and we'll have the places for the Americans and stuff like that and place to live and offices and stuff like that. So this is this is kind of Bono in a nutshell. This is kind of what we have and what we are fighting for. We're we're starting the church because our our thing is is it's it's God first and then and that so it's 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 creating the church so that we can filter all the decisions that we have through the church. You know, decisions to hire, decisions to do outreach, decisions to do VBS. So we're starting the church so that the community can be aspected and become connected and then once the church is built the school will be built and then we'll do the handicap facility and so we're still raising funds for that and, and dancing around what it's gonna look like officially and stuff like that. But in all in all, this is the Miriam Center, and so I kind of wanted to welcome you guys to why I'm incredibly, incredibly humbled, incredibly grateful that you guys are standing in front of me and willing to come from all different states and show up in Haiti and pick up a shovel and do this dance, and so, because it's going to be amazing, and someone asked me, what do we see Bono as being, and it's the blueprint. I can't tell you that I already have people that are at our doorstep asking us to do what we do here, just not in Haiti, but in places like like we've gone in, in India, because it's places like this that are, are it's starting to pave the way of what it means to actually truly love no matter what. So with that, welcome to the Miriam Center. Thank you for letting me talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.